but so delighted that my first guest today is somebody who has really broken the mould. There was a time maybe a decade ago when the idea of racing being significant in Scotland was almost out of the window. Lucinda Russell has put it back on the map and she's been awarded an OBE. She's won Cheltenham Festival races and she's won a Grand National and I think we are a little behind the time having you in the studio. It's great to have you here. I'm delighted to be here. It's, it's great. I mean, you talk about Scottish racing and Northern racing, and we are really, really proud of it. I'm very, very pleased that we're putting it back up on the map. But uh, it's great. We've got a lot of support. And I, I, I don't think I'm wrong, am I? Sort of 10, 15 years ago, people were saying, well, you, you simply can't train good winners in Scotland. It, it seemed to be in, in reverse gear. Yeah, I guess it's, you know... It's about facilities, but it's mostly about getting the good horses. And um, now the image of racing is really good. We're attracting good owners and owners are investing in it. And while we probably don't have the sort of many, many thousands that some, some owners do have, we're, we're getting good horses and that's what it's about. It's about getting the good horses. So take me right back to the beginning. When, when you were a, a young girl, what did you dream of? Oh, I just wanted to have horses. That's all. I, I was the kid, you know, I'm not really from a racing background. I'm more from very much from a horse background. Love the ponies, um, just adored them. And, and actually, even now, that still comes through it. You know, I'm happiest just going around the horses. But um, I just wanted to do something within horse, you know, looking after horses. I probably wanted to win a silver medal or a gold medal at the Olympics for show jumping. But um, that was that was changed, and I found racing very easy. So I went down the route of point to pointing, training point to pointers. Found it very easy. Um, I used to event, so getting a horse fit was very simple for me. Um, and uh, went into racing, found it easy, got better and better, and then Skew arrived on the scene. I have to say, he's probably taken the whole place up another level. You know, he he brought into it the professionalism, he brought into it um, just the knowledge of, of racing. And, and from there, uh, we sort of went on a bit of an upward trajectory. And it's it's great, and it's, it's something I'm very proud of. Well, you've crammed a course into a pint pot there, but... Yeah, when, when, when you were just starting out, pre-skew, you know, pre your real knowledge of uh, of horse racing, and just wanting to, to to have some kind of involvement with with horses, what can you remember the first time you 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 were involved with ponies that that you that you sort of really had that connection with the, with the animal? Oh, look, I I wasn't. My parents aren't horsey, so all I really wanted to do was to have a pony. And every Christmas, I used to write a little note: "Dear Mummy and Daddy, please can I have a pony? Please can I have a pony?" and um, I was 10 before I got one, but before that I'd made out lists of everything that I needed to have for my pony, or the tack that I needed, how I was going to you know, get it fit, everything. Um, I was just obsessed. Probably still am. And you don't know where that came from? It was just because you say your parents weren't, weren't horsey at all? I don't know. I think you know, any, any little girl that's had a connection with a pony, they, they understand it. It's just that whole... Um, it's just being with them. And you know, if you fast forward it, so now we, we're very lucky. We, we have horses going in big races and that's what comes with that is the stress of looking after them, the, the fear of injury, the um, wanting to get the horse there in the best condition. And, you know, you can wake up in the middle of the night thinking, oh, is, is this right? Am I, am I doing it right? Mm -hmm. What if, what if? And all you have to do is go down to the stable, go to look at the horse, spend that time with the horses. I mean, I always say that about a horse and you're, you know, we're, we're always worried about him and you just go into the stable and there he is. And he's, he says, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm a horse. And, and you have that connection with them. It's just, uh, that's magic. So actually, if you hadn't been informed by that from a young age, you wouldn't necessarily train the way you train. Is that what you're saying? So you, you understand animals. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think when you know other kids were listening to pop music or whatever, I was just spending time with the horses and, and learning how they, you know, learning learning how they communicate with you and learning how they um, how they act when they're when they're fit, when they're well, and when they're not fit. So, tell me about your childhood. Tell me about growing up in in Scotland. Um, really, uh, I suppose Skew takes the mickey out of me about this. You know, I had a very privileged childhood. I, I went to a very good all-girls school, um, hated every minute of it, wanted to be at home, looked out the window, just stared and wanted to be outside all the time. They were a brilliant school. They, they put through my exams. I got very good results. Off I went to university. Were you boarding? No, I wasn't. No, no I was day girl. So I used, to, I used to muck out my pony before I went. But, um, yeah, I just, just always wanted to be with horses. Pathetic, really, isn't it? Why? <laughs> I don't know. It's just, uh, oh, I suppose my parents and my, my brother definitely is always taking the mickey out of me about wanting to be a horse-brained um, half -wit, actually. I think it's what he called me. <laughs> he called you what? <laughs> we'll have to call the horse that now, won't we? Horse-brained half -wit. Yeah. Um, 
What does your brother do? Uh, so he's very successful. He sells uh, gin and whiskey, and we have a, a company called Edinburgh Gin, and he's absolutely brilliant. So he, he went into whiskey. the family business? He went into the family business, and he's extremely successful at it. I'm very proud of it. Um, delighted that he, he does that, and he doesn't, uh, he doesn't even own a horse, actually. I really should get him to do that. That's absolutely appalling. So what did your parents want for you? Uh, Mum and Dad have been brilliant. They, um, I suppose they just want you to be happy. It's like any parents, they just want you to be happy and be successful. And uh, the drive that I saw in my father, so he was selling whiskey as well, the drive that I saw in him and his business ideas, that's sort of been the foundation of my, my thing. I think, you know, OK, I love the horses, but I understand the business behind it. And, you know, you've got to, you've got to make sure that it's successful and, and how to sell it and how to sell the whole racing thing. So did he... T- tell me about his background, because he's obviously been incredibly successful as a, as a businessman. Um, was that in his family, or did he, did he start from scratch? So you're going to get me going off on a tangent now. So um, the whiskey inju- industry is very much family-based. It's, mm-hmm. it's always been, uh, it's been his relationship with other people, and I think that's what I've seen. And it's, things are done on trust, things are done on a handshake, things are done on loyalty to other people. And I'd like to think that we bring that into our industry and the way that we deal with things. You know, you have noticed that we have we're very um, we have jockeys that work for us. They work exceedingly hard, and we expect people to work very hard for us. But if they do, we show them the loyalty, and uh, that's why Derek Fox rides our Grand National winner. That's why Derek Fox is is you know riding all our horses, and we've got the young boys coming through. We've got Stephen Mulqueen, we've got Connor, we've got Patrick, and they we show them the loyalty because they show us the loyalty and that's the um so my whole business is founded on the same um ideals that my father had in his his business selling whiskey did did you understand that as a as a young person did you understand his principles his his business ideals did you did you figure that out from quite a young age yeah i think so and i think his um i think you absorb it don't you you know if you if you get put into a situation you absorb things and i saw you know growing up Dad wasn't there. He was he was on a plane to to France or to America or to um, Saudi selling selling drink. Um, and his his tenacity and his hard work is something that I, that you absorb. Um, and meanwhile, back at home, my mother adored her animals. She wasn't into horses, mm-hmm. but I saw that side of her and her her determination to keep working. And it it wasn't a case of stopping at five o'clock. You know, you have to keep on working. Tell me about your mother. Uh, Mum's great. She's um, she's very arty. She's a uh, I think so. You, you ha- you're either an artist or a scientist, and unfortunately, I've gone to the scientific side. She'd love love me to be arty, but I'm not at all. But uh, um, she's wonderful. Looks after, has an amazing sort of huge amount of animals, and she she cares for them. And you know, I, r- I remember in the middle of the night, she had a, an ill peacock or something. She'd put on her wellies and go out and check the peacock, and that's kind of what I do now. I go out, put on the wellies, go out and check the horses. So have you got a little bit of both? Then you've got that commercial side and the artistic side. Yeah, I wouldn't call it artistic, probably, but, well, maybe it's feeling. I, d- I don't know. I suppose that's right. It's um, a, a feel for things, but um, couldn't paint. <laughs> <laughs> so when did the idea of training racehorses really occur to you? Because you were you were an accomplished eventer. Yeah, I mean, um, so I love the eventing, um, and I still do, and I, I, I've seen it change. I, th- I think it's a fantastic sport, really, really enjoy it, and it certainly teaches you a huge amount of how to produce a horse well. But it was quite complicated, and you, you do extremely well. We've got an event up with us called Blair Castle. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was delighted. I was 14th there. And then I thought, hang on a minute, I'm 14th. That's not really, it's not brilliant, is it? Uh, and meanwhile, I was training point to pointers, and they were winning. And that was sort of simple to me. You know, the, you've got to do something that you're very good at. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I went into the point to pointing and then took because out the Because a top 20 finish at an event like Blair Castle would be considered to be a relatively elite result. But as you say, finishing 14th is no fun if you like finishing first. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's a, it's a great achievement. I think that's something that, you know, the eventing has to address. Well, not address, but it's... It, it's a, the eventing's very much a heart sport. You know, you have to put your whole soul, soul into it. And when I um, decided to go racing, I had to stop eventing because I thought you either do it 100% or you don't do it at all. And um, that's my attitude towards everything, you know. So I've thrown everything into racing. So... When was the, the moment where you thought, well, I want to do this wholesale, I want to throw myself into it, lock, stock and barrel? Um, just, uh, I had a very good horse, uh, so went point to pointing and then decided to take out my licence. And in those days it was very easy, you didn't need to do courses, you just had to go down and get interviewed and be a good person. And so you went down to the jockey club and we sat 
opposite side of a big table and I had an interview and I was deemed to be a good person and therefore able to train. But I didn't really know that much about it. I didn't know what a handicap was. So we, I bought a horse called Fively Builds, um, ran it at Perth and Andrew Thornton rode it. And uh, by chance, the race I entered it in, he was qualified for it, zero to 100 handicap chase and he won. So I thought, well, that's easy. So now I'm a trainer and I can win handicap chases. And um, I just... I just loved it. I loved, loved the buzz from it, loved the whole, you know, the sport. I mean, we're talking about racing. What, what's important about racing? It's the thrill of the chase. It's the thrill of the, uh, it's the sporting thing. And I often think, so a lot of our owners now will be in the sort of 50-year-olds. They've, they've enjoyed sport. They might have enjoyed rugby. But now they can come into racing because racing is a sport that is achievable. It's tangible. You can, um, you can be very good at it and you can have a horse that's very good at it and you can put your uh, desire to win that you had mm -hmm. maybe when you were playing rugby or you were doing other sport, you can put that into a horse and, um, and follow it. And I think that's something that, you know, when we look at the owners that we have now, a lot of our owners will either be horse people, or they'll be people that have achieved in other sports. Do you see a difference in owners now to, to the owners that you had when you started in oh. terms of their mindset, the, what they want out of the game? Oh, definitely. I mean, I think when we started, there was a lot of um, sort of old fashioned. So, so they bred their own and it was all through hunting and it was mm -hmm. through they'd always had horses. Um, we now get a lot of owners coming in that haven't had horses, don't understand really about the way that the horse um, moves and, and lives and the veterinary aspects of it. But they want they want the sport. And I think that's where we have to sell the sport. We have to sell racing to people that enjoy sport. How well do you think we're doing that? Pretty good. I think... Um, of course, I'm going to uh, bolster the Scottish racetracks. I think they look after the owners very, very well. That's what's important, it's looking after the owners, giving them a good day out and letting them enjoy it. And I think um, certainly the investment that is being put in now into the racetracks, and certainly, you know, Kelso, Air, uh, Musselburgh, Perth, they do a fantastic, fantastic job of looking after the owners. It's very important. When you started out with a licence and the 5D Bills won that first race, did you, did you have aspirations to be at the top of the tree, part of the kind of elite firmament of trainers, or did you just want to be training the odd winner, having horses around you? What were your, what were your ambitions? Um, I would hate you to realise, but I'm, I want to be the best. Of course you do. Now, we have to be sensible about it. I've never, you know, it's, it's hard to, you, you respect people like Paul Nichols, Nicky Henderson, they've been in the sport a long time, and I look at them and see why are they the best, why mm -hmm. are they so good at it. I think someone like Nicky Henderson is fantastic because he changes with the times. You know, he's been racing for and training horses for such a long time, but he can change as the veterinary practices change, so he, he embraces them. And I'd like to think that we can do the same, you know, that... Um, yeah, of course I want to be the best. And I think when you when you look at the, um, you know, the last year has been fantastic, the last few seasons. We've had winners at the Cheltenham Festival. We've had a Hoy Senior winning grade ones. We've had other horses winning listed races. And that's important to us. It's not just about having winners. Winners mm -hmm. are great and they're very, very important. But now we want to have the better horses be at the highest standard. And I think the owners are coming with us on that. So how many horses have you got now? We've, so this season we've probably got 85 in training, mm -hmm. but of them I'd say 15 of them will be young horses. They might not even race this year. We're, uh, to to get to the top, we're having to buy younger horses. We buy a lot of two-year-old stores from France um, and bring them through. So they, they take a long time. Um, but we're probably about 15 up. I don't know what percentage that is uh, on last season. Um, That's good in the current climate. Yeah, it's good and it's very important. We have to keep doing that. We have to keep putting in the young horses at the bottom. We're really lucky. We've got a great team. Everyone talks about team, um, but we've got a team that's been there for a few years now, and a lot of you know a lot of the people have been with us for for many years, and um, we now know the systems to train. When you started, did you think bigger was better? Um, I suppose yeah. I wanted to get a hundred horses. Of course, I did, and and we actually went up to a hundred in about twenty fourteen, twenty fifteen. We had loads and loads of winners. That was great. We broke the record for winners for a Scottish trainer in a season. Fantastic. But actually, it didn't bring us better horses. And that's when, you know, Scoo and I decided... We won, the, we won the Grand National with one for Arthur. That was fantastic. And from there, we said, right, you know, it's, it's like tasting. When you taste success like that, you just want it more again. It becomes mm. addictive. Um, so we went out and we said, right, we want to win at a better level. And uh, we've changed our buying policy. We buy what we train well. We've got some fantastic people looking for us. Paul McIver does great for us for 
for finding these horses. Um, and uh, yeah, we just we just want to keep on getting the better horses. Tell me about Skew. How did you meet him? Uh, how did we meet? Um, Tom Tom was riding for me. His mm-hmm. son was riding for me, and I think he used to drive him to the races. Um, so I kind of knew him then. I went to Tom's wedding. I sat next to to Skew at Tom's wedding, and uh, met him. And I don't know. We just sort of hit off. That was a good table plan, wasn't it? It was. Yeah, I think he did the seating plan. Funny that. <laughs> yeah, I'm lucky, eh? Yeah. So you just hit it off immediately. Yeah, I mean he's. Um, he was my hero. I, I knew him when he was riding, so that's that's quite useful. Um, I think he's kind of different to what I thought he was going to be, but he's we're just soulmates. We just, you know, we're we're both equally driven. We both um, we're probably both quite as emotional as each other, um, but we want to. We both work hard, and both you know he he rides out every day. I can't tell you his his work ethic is fantastic. You know, he gets gets up in the morning, he rides out, he watches the horses on the gallops, um, and I'd like to think I'm the same. You know, we just. Uh, if you work hard, you get the results. It's quite strange, that, isn't it? You you meet your heroes, and you ended up being a, a life partner of your hero. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm extremely lucky, and I, you know, you don't, you spend your life. You know, I was I was, I was married before, and that was that was just different. That was, uh, but when you met when I met Skew, it was just it was just going to happen. And you just knew right from the word go. Yeah, I think you know this is meant to be a racing program, not a love program. But I can tell you that it's just just something that we're, we're just together. But it's interesting you say that because I know a lot about your racing life, but I don't know a lot about Lucinda Russell, even though we've talked a million times over 25 years. Um, are you someone who likes to keep things quite separate like that? No, not at all. I mean, I think, uh, <laughs> you know, we've, we've got three dogs. We have a camper van. We enjoy our life together. And because of that, because we're happy, then we can train harder and we can be have the intensity about the racing because mm. we're happy together. So that actually has made a big difference to your professional life, that your personal life is in a good place. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you know, that's that's the thing. You know, we came, came down to London last night. You put yourself in a lovely hotel. Thankfully, it was dog friendly, so we took the dogs with us. And it's, you know, we, we've had a, a nice nice evening together, so I can come onto this show now. Um, I've got a great team at home. They're looking after the, everyone at home, and the intensity is still going at home. So what does what does Skew bring in terms of his own experience in the sport? Oh well, he's got it's the experience in the sport. That's exactly it. You know, he's um, he's been in racing. Or he's from a great racing family. Um, he's uh, it's the knowledge of the the horses. His relationship with the jockeys that we mm-hmm. have is very very important. You know, they they look up to him. Um, they're showing that picture of us uh, kissing at the at the Grand National, and you know. Talking to each other, it's very, very important for us. You know, the, um, Tom's children were with us, Margot and Myrtle. That it's just so important. You know, I don't think that you can the stress and the intensity of training. I don't think you could do that if you didn't have the the stability and the behind us. And, and in terms of of your own outlook, how do you how do you think you approach the game in a different way to other trainers? Because I've spoken to people who work for you, ride for you. And they say it's not like riding out for other people. It's not like working for other people. It's a very specific environment. What have you created there? Um, I think so going back to it, going back to when I was eight years old and just loving the ponies and mm-hmm. spending time with them, I think our yard is very much focused on the horse. It's very much focused on, on their their needs and, and what they want to do. So we turn our horses out every day and that's such a, it's such a basic thing. But we turn them out every day because that lets them be a horse. Now that brings increased work so we have to have good people we have people that are employed basically to turn horses in and out check them over afterwards mm. the standard of veterinary care now is increased massively in in our yard i think throughout the sport the standard of veterinary care is very good it's about the welfare of the horses you know it's um very that's very very important there's a high intensity and you know you have to work horses hard to get them fit and you've got to be you've got to be quite single-minded about um treating them as athletes and getting them into the right physical shape um, but you've got to ha- be able to stand back and just look at the horse, and I think that's what we—that's what our yards yards about. I was talking to Rob Hogarth yesterday, who who works with ITV Racing, and he said he rides out for you, doesn't he? Yeah. And he said that if you're if you're doing, is it called the fields? You have a you have a regime called the fields, where you all gallop across 
country and you lead. And he said, it's, it's absolutely terrifying. Because you go, <laughs> you're, in the, you're in front and you go flat out. And woe well, beside anyone who doesn't keep up. Well, I think um, that's about intensity. But, uh, yeah, we do. Uh, people have always joked about it. You know, it's like, follow me. I like being in front because I like being but you're the in boss. Front. I know, and I don't like getting mud in my face. But um, so we've, we we work from two yards. So mm-hmm. the first one yard is based at my parents. It's a very straightforward yard. We've we've got a stiff gallop there. That's the sort of bread and butter. That's where we get them fit. And then the week before and the week after racing, we go we take them to the farm, um, and we canter them around the fields. And it's it's nice for them. We're on them for a short time. Uh, it's like fartlek. Do you remember when you're doing your training? You run up and down hills. It's kind of like that. And we. We this keep is, the horses. This is not something familiar to me. Okay, so you weren't. <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> I thought you were. You're going ha- to have to educate me. <laughs> okay, so uh, it's just it's fun. It's it's training when they're they're enjoying themselves, mm-hmm. um, and uh, yeah, we do. It's, it, that's do I look like an athlete? Well, I don't know. Well, you do. You, you certainly look fit enough, anyway. Why? Thank you. You can come again. <laughs> so uh, yeah, no, we do. We, we go around the field. Rob is a fantastic. He's a He's with us. This is why we have to have very good riders riding for us. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we could talk about staff in, in, well, in racing. And we do on this programme so much. And most people who sit in that chair tell me how it's impossible to get staff. You can't get good riders. The sport's in crisis. Why is it different with you? I think we're really lucky in Scotland. You know, it's, um, we get a lot of people that are interested in horses. We, we, how we do it, we bring in the, the young kids. We bring them out of school. Conor McCann joined us. Um, he wasn't actually even meant to be leaving school, but we, we wrote and said that we'd keep educating him. Um, so Conor joined us when he was um, 15, mm-hmm. came to us. That, th- he's a typical example of what we get. We get kids in that are interested in horses. He was into pony racing. Um, we train them, Scoo's there to coach them. Um, we look after them. We've got Blair Campbell looking after them. We've Jamie Duff. We've, you know, the, they come into our, into our regime and we can train them up. Now, it's not for everyone. And I have a, a very strict thing that if it's not for you, they're better off doing something else. They might still be able to go into racing, mm. but they might just go into it in a different way. So we, uh, we have a high turnover within a month. We have a high turnover, a well, fairly high turnover within three months. But if they stay the three months, they'll be there forever. Um, and we just have to have high standards. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't suit them, it doesn't suit them. Um, we've, we're very lucky. Well, we're very lucky. I'm a trustee for a, a thing called the Scottish Racing Academy. And that's about training on the yard. So the kids can come to us and they can receive their training. They go through their, their levels on the yard. So they'll, they'll do a little bit of online and they also have tutors that come out and teach them. And so we're, we've got this huge influx of people coming into the sport. So I say they might, we might have a turnover and they might drop out, but actually if they stay with it, then they're going to be committed to it. Um, and we're very lucky, as I say, we, we attract good people. We um, train them up and I think that's, they, they can see the progression through the sport. So you have to be a good rider to survive at this end of Russell Yeah, race. I mean, maybe that's not fair with all races, but with us, we, yeah, we, we do have to, because we do go around the fields, they have to follow me, follow me, off they go. And what does that do for horses that other training regimes might not? Um, I think the way, that we, the way that we've set it up now, they, um, if they can stand the gallop at Arlery, then when they come to Kilduff, which is the, the farm, mm-hmm. it's very easy for them. Um, and they enjoy it and it keeps them right mentally. I mean, it's, we get them very buzzed up. You know, we're, we're very lucky. We're going through a good phase just now. We've got a great strike rate. And I think it's because the horses are very happy and they believe in themselves and they, they can run on at the end of a race. You know, when the other horses are jelly-legged, they, they go on. When was the moment in your career where you thought, I can do this, I'm, I'm, I'm a trainer? <laughs> I'm probably arrogant, but probably when the horse won on his first when Fively Bills won with Andrew Thornton riding him. But I don't know. I just I think that was the the main thing. I, it's very it, you know we're we're in a, a thing of training horses to win a race. It's not it's not rocket science. You have to get them very fit. You have to put them in the right race. Um, as we've got bigger, I have to have a bigger team, and I've got a team that I really I really trust, and um, they've been fantastic. I'm very very lucky with the team that we've set up. Um, so we we've, we've very good man called Paul McIver. I've mentioned him already. Mm-hmm. He he sorts out where the horses are going to go. He sees it with no emotion, so he can he reads a race very very well. So we can put the horses in the correct race, and I think that's that's part of training, isn't it? So it's it's pulling the team around you that are good. Um, my horse sense and the way that I can look at a horse and know what they want. That's something that I I bring to it. 
um, setting out the training regimes, knowing how much you can push your horse. You know, some horses take a lot of training, some won't, won't take so much. Um, so I can sort of do that, and then I have the, the rest of the team beside me. When you won a race at the Cheltenham Festival with, with Brindisi Breeze, just take me back to that day and how that felt for you. Yeah, it was great. So I w- went on Twitter this morning and saw that we'd put together that, that compilation of the races. That was fantastic. So at that stage, Brindisi, um, I think going back, you know, remember I started off, you know, the, the, we had nine horses in the yard. So when we got to the Brindisi days, we probably had about 40, 40 horses. Mm. Um, we'd started to get a bit better. Brindisi, that was what, 2012? Yeah, that's yeah. right. So Brindisi was was an expensive horse. He had uh, run, he'd been beaten as bumper, but he started to improve. And he was one of the slowest horses on the gallops. And Skew laughs about it. We were talking about it the other day. We used to have to, he used to get really cross if people mm. went past Brindisi on the gallops. He used to shout at them. So we, so Brindisi had why, to make why? it. He was so slow and we didn't want to demoralise the horse. But did you think he was good, even though he was sl- slow yeah. on the gallops? Yes, and I think Campbell's uh, belief in him. We, we, we'd we run him at uh, Newcastle and uh, he, he won, but it was just a novice hurdle. Uh-huh. And uh, But then we took him to Haydock and um, Skew went in to get the saddle from Campbell and he was saying, you know, have to watch him and, and here we are, it's a step up and trip. And Campbell said, Skew, I couldn't pull him up at Newcastle. So it's Campbell's belief in Brindisi and I think that's what came through that day at Cheltenham. It was a very personal thing. Um, you know, Campbell was, was very much part of the team. He was the young up and coming star in our in our yard, great personality, and not just in your yard. Person. Absolutely, yeah, no, that's right. He was just fantastic, and the the emotion. You know, Brindisi was a little horse. He wasn't he wasn't big, and Campbell was young, and there they were in front, and they were never going to be caught. You know, it was just fantastic. Um, it was a brilliant day. I don't know. Did I appreciate that it was a Grade One at Cheltenham? I'm not sure. I think Skew had to tell me that. Mm. Um, you know, it's uh, it's it's funny when things happen. You think, well, that's easy. It's not easy. It's you know, winning is never easy. You have to really appreciate it. Um, and it was brilliant to share it with Campbell and and his par- his mother, you know, Leslie. And it was just fantastic. Great day. The next few months were almost impossibly difficult. You lost the horse and Campbell. Um, did you ever think you could you could really rebuild from that? Yes. Yeah, so um, racing is really emotional. You know, and when you when you have the highs, you're going to have the lows. I didn't realise it was going to be that much of a low, and I think it does put it into perspective. Um, one of the things that I learnt from it, oddly enough, was about the press. So um, I found it quite difficult because you have the, all the emotion. Okay, so it is just the worst thing in the world. I mean, crikey, what Leslie was going through—it was his her her son. You you shouldn't have to bury mm-hmm. your kids. You know, that's one of the things. And I found it quite hard because the press saw me as the the person they could go to. And it's kind of like they were prodding you. Tell me again. Tell me again how upsetting it was. Tell me again. Tell me more emotion. And I, that sort of, that shocked me, but it's something you have to cope with. You know, talk about being resilient. You have to learn to cope with that. Um, it was a very tricky time. But we went back. You know, you turn away from it. You go back to the yard and there are the horses. And they're the staff. And I remember Skew walking onto the yard the day that we heard that Campbell had died. And he said, look, this is just terrible. You know, you do get emotional about it. I still get emotional about it now. Because we had to go through it together as a team. And, and, and everyone deals with it in different ways. It's quite a raw thing. It's a very public thing, isn't it? It's a private thing, but it's made public. And that, that was hard. Um, look, we'll never forget Campbell. And it was, you know, it drives us on. It's, uh, that's the thing. I, I wish he was still with us. It wasn't to be, but um, I think he'd be proud of us. And you strike me as somebody who's, in many respects, quite pragmatic and quite you know, practical, and the horses are there, and y- y- you're not overly sentimental. But that's you know, losing him and losing the horse in the same, in the same few months. It's a, it must have been a very unsettling experience. Yeah, but that's what I mean about when you then go back to the horse. Yeah. But it's, you know, you do get very emotional. The, thing, the things that we are emotional about is the horses. And, you know, you can take comfort in the horses. You know, that's that's where you, you know, still now, if you get upset about something, you just go back and go into the stable and, and see the horse. That's the that's the grounding. That's the, that's the rock of it. In terms of 
what you want to achieve from now to the wherever the career ends do you do you still have very clear goals clear targets um i don't know if we have targets i know that we've we've learned that we what we're good at and so this season we've we've bought the horses that we know we're going to train well and that's shown that shows in our results mm. so i think we're we're now more um we're we're very very driven to do it, I know I come over as being very laid back, and it's it's very nice, and you have to be pragmatic, you have to be sensible about it. But underneath it, there's a there's a real drive to it. That's um, it's, it's an interesting bit of self awareness that like you say I come over as being very laid back. Mm. The reality being somewhat different. Yeah, I mean, I think you, you've you've put it right there. I'm pragmatic. You, you have to say to yourself, right? There's some things you can control, and th- some things you can't. Did Campbell's death teach us that? We can't control that. But what we can control is how we come out of it. And I think, uh, you know, you, you have to play with the cards that you're dealt. But all I know is that we want to keep on winning. We want to keep being proud of Scotland, being proud of the North, being proud of our horses and being so proud of our team. You know? So when I teed that up at the beginning of this interview, I was wondering whether I was leaning on some sort of hackneyed ideal that you were, you were an ambassador for Scotland, an ambassador for the North and that you would reject that. You don't. You actually see that as being very important to you. Yeah, I like that. But I, I would say that we train in Britain. You know, that's why we have runners stay at Cheltenham. We'll have runners, you know, runners wherever. We'll be down at Sandown. We'll be at Newbury. That's mm. important to me. But I do feel that, you know, we, our, our team jackets have got a Scottish flag on the, on the sleeve. And that's because, we're, you know, we are representing Scotland. And it's great. We, we get a good following in Scotland. We're making Scotland more aware of horse racing. Um, and it's important, you know. It's, it's, uh, it's how we're going to drive the whole sport forward. We've managed to talk for half an hour. I've not even mentioned your Grand National winner or a Hoy Senor, but we've got plenty of time to do that, and we'll do that right after this.